100 Proofs the Israelites Were White Version 2 by True Fids. 1. The Origin and Migrations of the European People We Europeans are everywhere. We are on every continent and in every corner of the world. Wherever we've gone, we have thrived and built great Christian civilizations based on Yahweh's laws. However, we were not always spread across the world. At one time, we were within the bounds of Europe, and we originated from a mass of Germanic tribes who swarmed into Europe. Back then, we had different names, our tribal names names, such as Franks, Saxons, Angles, Goths, Vandals, and many more. So if we came from these Germanic tribes, then where did the Germanic tribes come from? Did they just magically appear out of thin air? Now on the other hand, most people these days have at least a basic, vague outline of the story within the Bible, how Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, the creation of the 12 tribes of Israel, how Yahweh led them out of Egypt under Moses to invade the land of Canaan, but eventually they were deported by the Assyrians. From here on, all trace of the Israelites fade into history. So where did they go? Is that where the story ends? Well, not quite. In the 19th century, archaeologists began digging up and excavating the Middle East and uncovered many ancient tablets and inscriptions, and they even discovered Nineveh, the ancient capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Upon translating those tablets and inscriptions, it was discovered that the kings of Assyria recorded their conquests and boasted of invading the land of Israel and deporting hundreds of thousands of both Israel and Judah, but they didn't call them Israelites. Instead, the Assyrians called the Israelites Kimri or Bit Kimri, meaning people or house of Omri, and this is because around that time, King Omri was the dynasty ruling over the northern kingdom of Israel, so they called the Israelites after their king. Now the King James Version, they translated the King Kimri to King Omri, and this is because in Hebrew, the name Omri is spelt with the Chayin letter, the one that looks like an I, which can be a guttural C or G-like sound, but alternatively a vowel-like sound, and this is why most modern Bibles chose to translate the Chayin to an O to make it Omri, but the Assyrians instead went with a C or K-like sound for Kimri. About a hundred years later, the Assyrian Empire collapsed, and some of the Israelites immediately went on and invaded Anatolia and in Greece. The Greeks used the name Kimeroi from Kimri, which we anglicized to Chimerians. Now the next empire to rise up in the east was the Babylonian Empire, and they called the Israelites Gimiri, so they preferred a G-like sound. And not long after, the Persian Empire rose up, and they had a new name altogether. They called the Israelites Sake or Sake Sune, meaning the sons of Sake. One historian, Sharon Turner, believed that that is the origin of the name Saxons, from that Saxony Persian name given to our ancestors long ago. Now even during the Persian period, the Israelites were migrating into Europe in larger and larger numbers, and they began using a new name, Scythians, for themselves. And the Greeks also had a new name for them, Galatahi. Now Scythians is derived from the Hebrew word Sukoth, which means tent dwellers. As the historian Herodotus explains, at this time our ancestors had no permanent cities, but lived constantly on the move, with the women and children in wagons, and the men on horseback with bows and arrows. As for the Greek name Galatahi, the ancient historian Homer mocked the Scythians, calling them Galactophagi, meaning milk-fed. It is likely that Galatahi originates from milk drinkers, as Gala in Greek means milk. Our ancestors survived on the meat and milk of their cattle. Eventually, by 390 BC, the Galatahi had invaded Italy and went on to sack Rome. The Romans shortened the name Galatahi to just Gali, 
which we anglicise to Gauls. The Roman historian Livy calls the Gauls at this time a strange race, new settlers, as the Romans had never before seen these people because they were newcomers to Europe. The Gauls pushed even further west into Europe and some settled in what was already called Celtica or France today and mingled with the Celts. The land was renamed to Gaul. So now we get to the last name, German, Germanic, Germania. For this we can thank none other than Julius Caesar. When Caesar invaded Gaul, he distinguished between the Gauls in France, who had mingled with the Celts, and the Gauls still in the rest of Europe over the Danube River. He called them the Germans, meaning genuine, true, authentic, sincere, as he saw them as the pure Gauls. Now this is of course Caesar's perspective, in reality they they were all Israelites, we'll get to that later. Nevertheless, the name German was born. The famous historian Strabo states that these Germanic or Galatai people were from the Western Rhine which would be Holland and the border of Switzerland today all the way back to the Dnieper River by the Black Sea, which would be the Ukraine today, an enormous mass of people. And Pliny, a Roman historian, tells us that the name of Scythians has been changed to Germans because they, including the Chimerians and Galatahi, are all one and the same people. So we Europeans come from these Germanic tribes and all of the Germanic tribes migrated to Europe from the Middle East and that is why we are sometimes Times referred to as Indo-Europeans and also Caucasians as many of our ancestors migrated over the Caucasus mountains to enter Europe. Thus we can trace our lineage back in time and know with certainty that we are the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We are the people of the Bible, we are the inheritors of the biblical promises and prophecies and there is no true Christianity without a true understanding of this ancient history. We are the children of God and the Bible is our history and no one else's. Be sure to check out the website truthvids.net. Here you can find all the 100 proofs material, the latest videos, articles and much more. You can read the proofs, download it all and please be sure to spread the truth around. Praise Yahweh. 2. The laws of God are everywhere in white European civilizations. Yahweh gave his law to Israel only and not to any other people. He gave his law through Moses, first on Mount Sinai and later through Moses' rulings as the Israelites traveled through the desert to the promised land. Much later, King David confirms all this where he states that the word was only declared to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances only to the children of Israel. It follows logically then that if Yahweh's laws are only for Israel, then only Israel and their descendants will have his laws and only Christian Europeans have built their civilizations on the foundations of Yahweh's moral laws. No other race has done that because God's laws are not in their nature. As Yahweh declared, he wrote his laws into Israel's genetic nature where he said he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and that the laws would be in our inward parts and he will be our God and we will be his people. Originally upon entering the land of Canaan, our ancestors were commanded to exterminate the Canaanites, else they would corrupt our Israelite ancestors. As Yahweh tells us, any that remain will be pricks in our eyes, fawns in our sides, and shall vex us in the land of Canaan, or wherever we dwell. Unfortunately, our ancestors failed to do so, and because our ancestors failed to obey Yahweh, they were eventually corrupted and instead turned to paganism, even mingling with the Canaanites and adultering their bloodline. Once the Israelites were deported and resettled in Europe, they were separated from the accursed Canaanites and once we got Christianity, we were once again able to obey Yahweh's laws. And wherever you go in Europe, you will find moral law and an innate respect for law and order. This proves that we are the Israelites of the Bible. It is only since the infiltration of Antichrist elements into all of our countries have we suddenly began to depart apart from Christian laws that our once Christian Israelite forefathers established. So it's all like the land of Canaan long ago it's the same thing happening. We are being corrupted once again by the same people. 
Three all European countries and nations were Christian. Historically, once a white European nation accepted Christianity, there was no going back. Christianity began to spread to Europe very quickly after the resurrection of Christ and swept across the entire white world. Most of our ancestors converted willingly, and once they became Christian, they never returned to their former pagan religions. As Christ promised, his sheep heard his voice and they embraced Christianity precisely because they were his sheep. Europeans were already his sheep, his Israelites genetically. We did not become his sheep through a declaration of faith or a trip to the baptismal font. Never before in history has an entire race converted collectively to one religion, but the Europeans did. From that time onwards, every European nation remained proudly Christian, at least up to our modern times. For centuries, Europe was known as Christendom, the land of the Christian people. There was no other Christianity anywhere else, and as Christ promised, he would regather all Israelites together, for he had other sheep which are not in this pen. By this he mean there were Israelites who were in Judea, and there were Israelites scattered across Europe, and they became one body under their shepherd who is Christ. Furthermore, throughout the centuries, wherever Europeans had set up new colonies and new nations, they were always Christian. No pagan colony or nation was ever form or even proposed by Europeans. Our ancestors were truly godly people who took their faith very seriously. But now Antichrist in positions of power gloat and proclaim that Europe is now post-Christian and religiously and cultural diverse. This was not our doing, it was their doing. Today all the Christian nations have been systematically infiltrated by satanic and antichrist forces who have undermined our Christian governments, laws, morals and society, and even Christianity itself. But Yahweh is not mocked forever. For Jacob's seed to spread across the whole world. Yahweh promised that Jacob's seed, the Israelites and their descendants, would spread across the whole world. Yahweh's people were never destined to remain in Palestine. According to Genesis 28, thy seed would be as the dust of the earth and would spread to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This was the promise to Abraham, and only the Europeans have ever achieved such a wide dispersion. When we look at maps from only over a century ago, we can clearly see the extent of white European civilization and colonization we have spread across the entire world, populating every continent and bringing the blessing of Christianity with us. This expansion was foretold more than once in scripture. At the time of his death, Moses prophesied that the horns of Joseph would drive the Israelites to the end of the earth. This implies that Joseph's tribe meaning Ephraim and Manasseh, in particular would be largely responsible for spreading the Israelites across the world. And this is of course the maritime British Empire and later America which did accomplish this. Later around 700 BC, Isaiah the prophet spoke to the Israelites who were being deported by the Assyrians that Jacob was to take root, Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the whole world with fruit. Therefore that fruitfulness never happened in the lands of Canaan, but was to happen after the deportations when the Israelites became the numerous Germanic tribes. So all the European colonies and nations founded by Europeans were Israelite nations, and in this way the prophecy was fulfilled that the seed of Jacob would spread across the entire world. 5. To be known as sons of God and called by a new name, Christians. Yahweh declared that his people would have a new name, they would be named after him, the living God, and that name is Christian. According to the prophet Hosea, who is speaking to the children of Israel who are about to be deported, he said that yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in that place where it was said to to him, you are not my people. There it shall be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. We are the sons of Christ, or Christians. The living God 
was, of course, Yahshua Christ or Jesus Christ. Yahshua is Yahweh, the living God of Israel, incarnated in the flesh as a living, breathing Adamic man. Yahshua came down from heaven and was born of the line of Judah for the salvation of his people, his family, the children of Israel. Yahshua declared himself the Messiah or the Christ in Greek of Israel and after his resurrection, his apostles began preaching that he was the Christ, the Savior of Israel. In Acts, we Learned that in Antioch the disciples were first called by the name Christians and as the gospel spread throughout Europe, the European people embraced the faith and also the name of Christian as Christian means the people of Christ or people of the Messiah. By adopting this name, the Europeans became a race named after the living God thus fulfilling the prophecy of Hosea. So it should be noted that God did not promise to give his name to all the peoples of the world. The name was for his people, the genetic descendants of Israel and nobody else, not to any other non-European people and not to random people within other races who might profess a belief in him. The promise was only to Israel and throughout history only one race, the Europeans, have called themselves Christian. Logically it makes sense that the Europeans are the Israelites who who were promised to be called after the living God, Christ. 6. Israel's new home to be primarily to the northwest Canaan was never the permanent home for Israel. How could it be when Yahweh promised that the children of Israel would become a vast multitude that would spread all over the earth? In addition, sharing Canaan with the wicked Canaanites proved disastrous to the spiritual health of Yahweh's people time and time again. So Yahweh promised his children a new home far away from the accursed Canaanites. As we read in Samuel, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. It's important to note that Yahweh divided the land amongst the Adamic people from Noah. As we read in Deuteronomy, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. This means looking at the nations that formed from Noah, Europe was left undesignated and that would eventually be the new home for the children of Israel. So now we'll move on to Isaiah and he was a prophet during the Assyrian deportations around 722 BC. In Isaiah 11 he states that some of the Israelites escaped, that they fled on the ships of the Philistines or in some translations other tribes towards the west, so Europe, and then they would later spoiled the east together. The Israelites did indeed spread to Europe but centuries later once they'd become more powerful under Alexander the Great and later the Romans they did reconquer the east so this prophecy took many centuries to be fulfilled. Now later Isaiah makes another prophecy in Isaiah 41 this time directly to the Europeans. He states, to the islands or coastlands to renew their strength. The settlements in Europe did indeed begin to become powerful from the Assyrian deportations onwards and in the next verse he states that a righteous man from the east would be king over all nations. This righteous man can only be Christ who comes from the east but that geographical direction is from the perspective of the dispersed Israelites. Thus it confirms that the Israelites were indeed already living in the west in their new home in Europe by the time of Christ. Next Jeremiah who was a prophet during the Babylonian deportations. In Jeremiah 3 he pleads with the deported Israelites who are in the north and he refers to them as backsliding Israel. So Jeremiah was a hundred years after Isaiah and we see the Israelites haven't just disappeared, they're still in the north at that time. Some had already begun to migrate even further north into Europe and a few verses later Jeremiah declares that the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and will be joined together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your father. This new land of inheritance can only be within Europe. On to the next prophet, this time Hosea. Hosea makes another messianic prophecy in Hosea 11 where he declares that they, the Israelites, will walk after the Lord, after Yahweh, 
and he, Yahweh as Christ, will roar like a lion, and when he will roar, then the children, the Israelites, will tremble in the west. So the Israelites must have been in the west, in Europe, when Christ came. 7. The True Meaning of the Hebrew Word Adam The fact that the Israelites were white is contained in the name Adam, the name of the first white man. Adam is a Hebrew name that means to be ruddy and to blush in the face, both of which only the white race is capable of. In fact, the Hebrew word dam means blood by itself. Furthermore, we know that from Genesis that Yahweh created Adam in his own image and his own likeness. So, since Eve was created from Adam's body, and since all the Israelites descended from Adam and Eve through Noah, then the Israelites and the entire Adamic race must have been white and ruddy. So let's examine the name Adam and its various meanings in James Strong's Concordance. He divided the word into categories for each different meanings. The first H119, which is a verb to show blood in the face, to be blushing or flushing, and to turn rosy. Next H120, it's a noun and it's Adam kind, or any man or woman descended from Adam and Eve. And next H121, it's Adam a proper name, and this is the first man Yahweh God created. And lastly, H122, an adjective to describe something as ruddy or red in complexion. In English, we would have separate words for these Hebraic meanings. For example, we would say, she is blushing, but in Hebrew, you would say, she is adaming. We would say to redden something, but in Hebrew, to adam it, and so forth. Obviously, the name Adam tells us that the first man was a ruddy white man who could blush, and in the name Adam, we find the truth about who the Israelites were and are today. 8. The Adamic Nations That Emerged From Noah All the white Adamic and Israelite nations came from Noah and his three white sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, and we can trace their lines through the Bible and history. The early artwork and written descriptions show that these were indeed white nations. We will start with Japheth. Seven nations came from Japheth's seven sons. We will start with Javan or Yavanna, he was the father of the Ionian Greeks, and Athens became their major city, and from there they spread to the islands of the Mediterranean and the coast of Spain. Most surviving Greek history was written by white Athenians, Homer, Thucydides, Plato, and Xenophon. Next, we'll move on to Madai, or the Medes. The Medes joined with the Persians in the Medo-Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great. By around 300 BC, when the Israelites, the Lost Tribes, began to take control of the Jebethite tribes, the Medes started calling themselves Aryans, and were the first nation to do so. It is likely that the word Aryan comes from two Hebrew words, Ah meaning mountain, and Yah which is a shortened form of Yahweh. Thus Aya means the mountain of Yahweh or the people of Yahweh. Next, Tiras which is the Thracians, they live north of Greece, and all of their artwork depicts them as white, often with red hair. As the Israelites swept into Europe, they brought many of the Medes with them as slaves, and large numbers settled in Europe which became the land of Sarmatia. The Israelites overrun Thrace and enslaved many Thracians. These Thracian slaves were called Fraus, and the name appears in many old Germanic folktales. Both the Thracian Fraus and the Sarmatians were depicted as white in all historical records. Next, Tubal and Meshech, they settled above the Caucasus Mountains. Little historical records about them remain, but we do know that they were displaced by the invading Israelite Scythians as they were pushed north into the land we now call Russia. The Mosky, one of the tribes, were likely derived from Meshech. The name Moscow comes from Mosky, and Russia also had a city called Tubal. Thus we see the remnants of Jepephite tribes in modern Russia, but no records survive of the tribes of Gomor and Magog. However, if we can identify the other Jepephite tribes, Tribes as white, five out of seven, we can safely assume Gomer and Magog were white as well. And this is how Noah's prophecy was fulfilled that Japheth would ultimately dwell in the tents of Shem, because we Europeans are Shem, we're the last remnant, the Israelites, who are a portion of Shemites, and amongst us, amongst us Europeans, there are some remnants of Japhethites living with us. Moving on to Ham, four nations came from Ham's four sons. 
First, we will start with Cush, and it included what we now call Ethiopia and Arabia. In biblical times, they were both called Cush, Cush of the East, Arabia, and Cush of the West, Ethiopia. Now, the word Ethiopia actually means sunburnt face, and that description only applies to white people living in the scorching hot conditions of those regions. Next, Mizraim was Egypt. When scripture refers to Egyptians, it refers to them as Mizraim. Many mummified pharaohs and Egyptian royalty have been dug up, and most have white skin, fair or reddish hair, and blue eyes. They have white facial features and skull shape. Egyptian artwork generally shows native Egyptian males as white with golden or bronze tans, and native Egyptian women as pale white. Men generally worked outside with little coving so they were heavily tanned, whilst the women stayed indoors and remained pale. On to Foot, he became the Libyans. The land of Foot was located west of Egypt, but Foot was overshadowed in size and strength by both Egypt and Ethiopia. One ancient Greek writer, Aeschylus, wrote a play where he described the ancient women of Argos, who would be the Danan Greeks, as looking just like the women of Libya, but also if they rode camels could be confused with the Ethiopian women, or if they used bow and arrows could be confused with the Amazons. The Amazons were Sarmatian women, so a combination of Scythians and the Medes. If Helen of Troy, as well as all Greek Danon women were white, typically with blonde and red hair, and they looked the same as Libyan and Ethiopian women. Well, it shows that the world was very different back then, and these nations in North Africa originally back then were white. Lastly, Canaan, he became the father to the ancient Canaanites. They lived in the land of Canaan and were later conquered by the Israelites. Canaan was cursed by Noah, his grandfather, to be a servant of Japheth and Shem. Because of this curse, it was likely that other Adamic tribes shunned intermarriage with the Canaanites. Like all the Adamic nation, the Canaanites were originally white, but early on they began to intermarry with surrounding non-Adamic tribes and corrupted the bloodline, so Nephilim and the descendants of Cain. And now on to Shem, five nations came from Shem's five sons. We'll start with Elam, he was the progenitor of the ancient Persians. The name Persian comes as a result of a case of misidentification by the Greeks. In Greek legends, Perseus was an ancient Greek heroic figure who beheaded the fearsome Medusa, and the Greeks believed that the Persians descended from him. In time, the Persians joined forces with the Medes, as we said, and became powerful. Now, Xenophon gives us descriptions of the Persians. He accompanied the Spartans when they had an invasion of Anatolia and took many Persians prisoner. They stripped them naked to show their men how soft and flabby the Persians had become, and Xenophon comments how white and pale they are because they covered themselves up all the time. Furthermore, Greek sculptures have been found, and when the original colors have been restored, we can see that the Greek men fought in the nude and were typically muscular with some color, but the Persians were incredibly pale because they kept themselves covered up, just how Xenophon described them. Asher is the father of the Assyrians. They worship pagan gods, and one of them was named Asher. Over the generations, this tribe had forgotten Yahweh and turned their own patriarch, Asher, into a god, which they spelled Asa, dropping the H. The Shemite Assyrians spread all over the Middle East below the Caucasus Mountains, and they grew into a formidable empire which ruled most of the white Adamic world of the time. In fact, Yahweh used the Assyrians to punish the Israelites with deportations when they transgressed against him. Lud was the father of the Lydians who settled in Anatolia, which we'd call West Turkey today in Europe. Also, the Etruscans in Italy, located above Rome, were a Lydian colony, and the surviving Etruscan artwork shows white-skinned people. As with the early Egyptian art, men were white but tanned, and women were white but pale. Again, this is due to the men working outside and the women remaining inside. Aram was the progenitor of the Arameans who lived above the lands of Canaan. Generally, they're always called Syrians in the Bible, which was the Roman given name to the region and was a corruption of the name of the seaport Tyre. As for the last one, Arthur said, in his descent was Eba, which is where we get the name Hebrew from and from where Abraham and the Israelites descended. There's no record of any lands of Arphazad, so perhaps at one time they were dispossessed. That's why Abraham dwelt in the lands of Aram, 
As opposed to his own patriarch's lands, he lived in Pandaram, meaning the plain of Aram or Syria. Now the inhabitants there were also called Chaldeans, and a portion of the Chaldeans conquered Babylon and rebuilt the city. By Daniel's time, King Nebuchadnezzar was a Chaldean, indicated he descended either from Aram or Arphazad. Now when Daniel prophesied to the king Nebuchadnezzar, he is described as going pale with fear, something only a white man can do, so clearly the Babylonians were white as well. So you can see it's entirely possible to trace the history of Noah and his white sons and the white nations they gave rise to. Yahweh has preserved this history right in the Bible. 9. Christ came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ clearly stated he came only for one people, and that is the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So despite Christ's clarity, most modern Christians are deceived into believing that Israel is spiritual, and anyone who believes in Christ is part of Israel. But Christ actually meant what he said. He came only for the genetic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants who had long since migrated and became the Europeans. Firstly, Yahweh's promise of eternal life was to all Adamites, as we read in Genesis, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Here Yahweh is promising Adam kind eternal life, so long as they cling to their own kind genetically, the tree of life. Then all their descendants will inherit eternal life. Also we see in Peter's epistle that Christ went to the Adamites who had died centuries before in Noah's flood and saved them. Furthermore, Christ himself declared that the men of Nineveh would rise up in judgment, meaning the Assyrians would be resurrected. Also, the Queen of the South would be raised. This is referring to Solomon's time, the Queen of Sheba, referring to the Sabians, Hamites. The modern idea that all believers go to heaven is a lie, but all Adamites will be saved and resurrected because the eternal spirit is breathed into them. This is why Paul confidently explains to the Corinthians that death was brought in the world through one man, Adam, and restoration of the dead would also come through one man, Christ. Just as in Adam all will die, but like Christ we will all be resurrected, meaning all Adamites have eternal life. And as Christ further explained in his revelation, that death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire, meaning be destroyed, and only those written in the book of life will have eternal life. The book of life is the Bible. The Bible is the story of the Adamic race. In other words, if you're not an Adamite, you're not written in the book of life. Secondly, Yahweh saw his relationship with Israel as though it was a marriage. He said to the dispersed Israelites, return, O backsliding children, for I am married to you. So here we see it was a marriage. When our Israelites' ancestors accepted the law at Mount Sinai, their promise to obey was their marriage vow, and this vow tied all their descendants to Yahweh forever as his bride. But later in the land of Canaan, the Israelites left Yahweh's law and mixed with the Canaanites, and this was counted against them as the sin of adultery. When they would not repent, Yahweh divorced them and allowed them to be deported. Now technically, under the law, the death was the penalty for adultery. According to the law, a man who divorced his wife could not take her back, as we read in Deuteronomy. This law created a dilemma, as Yahweh, according to his own law, could never take Israel back. However, Yahweh's intention was always to remarry Israel forever, and this is why Christ called himself the bridegroom. He is Yahweh come down in the flesh for the purpose of seeking out and saving his bride. So according to the law, the only way this could work is either the bride, Israel, died, or the husband, Christ died. If her husband died, Israel would be free from the penalty of death and free from her ties to her former husband. Only then would she be able to marry him again legally. Therefore, Christ had to die in order to release his bride. Then by being resurrected, he could remarry her once more. This is exactly what he did. This is why in Christ's revelation towards the end, there is the supper of the Lamb where Yahweh or Christ will remarry Israel. And it must be noted that there is no room for any other wives or any other people in this relationship. As Christ himself said, he came only for Israel.
10. The Bible prophesied Israel would have a new language. Ancient Hebrew was always destined to die out and disappear as a language. According to biblical prophecy, it was never meant to be revived, and in its place, Yahweh promised to give his children a new language. This new, better language would be a pure language, in which the Israelites would all call upon the name of the Lord or Yahweh, as Zephaniah tells us. To the ancient Israelites, this new language would sound like stammering lips. And another tongue, said Isaiah the prophet, because it would be unfamiliar to their ears. And since the Europeans are the descendants of the ancient Israelites, and since English is the main language of the Europeans, only English can be their new language promised by Yahweh. When the Europeans became Christian and were reconciled to Yahweh, they did indeed call upon the name of Yahweh, Jesus Christ, in this new tongue, for Christ is Yahweh incarnated. In fact, all European languages derived from ancient Hebrew, the Israelite Phoenicians brought Hebrew with them as they colonized the coastlands. In Greece, the Hebrew alphabet was improved by the addition of several letters, particularly vowels, thus Coin Greek was born, and the Romans in Italy improved the language and alphabet by creating even more letters from which developed Latin. Then the Germanic tribes adopted the Latin alphabet and improved it again, creating our modern 26-letter alphabet. Many of our European words can also be traced back through Latin, through Greek, right back to the ancient Hebrew. It's obvious that as we, the ancient Israelites, dispersed all those centuries ago, we took our spoken language and written alphabet with us, and over thousands of years we improved and adapted our mother tongue to our new situations and ended up with our modern European languages, of which English is the most widely spoken and understood. Even today, the King James Bible and most popular translations are in English. It's natural for languages to change, and it's no surprise that as prophesied, real Israelites would be speaking European languages, and especially English today.